Scripture tells us to not neglect the gathering of the saints. For too long, many of our churches have been shuttered and our gatherings curtailed. During this Lenten season, it is time to beautify our sacred spaces and return to our traditions. Ad Crucem is having a sale on our church banners. For the month of March, our banner prices will be reduced by up to 30%. Visit adcrucem.com to take advantage of this incredible pricing. That's A-D-C-R-U-C-E-M dot com. Listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Today we have a hymn sing with Sarah Day. La, 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 la. So it's not quite Holy Week yet, but I wanted to cover a smaller chunk, or at least relatively smaller chunk, of hymns in the hymnal for this hymn sing episode. And I did actually already do all of the Lent hymns in our hymnal on a podcast way back in, uh, I think, 2019, pretty sure. But that's when I was young and naive and thought that I could do all of the Lent hymns in one podcast. I don't know what so I was cute. thinking. We <laughs> talked about like, at like two and a half times faster than she is right now. Yeah. It's a yeah. very fast talking Sarah episode. We all oh, make mistakes. Yeah. So we're we'll be going back and revisiting some of those Lent hymns in the coming years of Lent because page fifteen of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's too many. Um there was too so many. so we did already cover a few of these Holy Week hymns already. But Today is going to be specifically on the Holy Week section of our Lutheran service book. Before I get too far into this, as usual, my plug for the Hymnal Companion from Concordia (laughs) Publishing House. If you are a hymn nerd like I am and you love to know the stories behind the hymns and the people who write those hymns, you should absolutely get a Hymnal Companion from Concordia Publishing House for the Lutheran service book. It is worth it. Every penny, you will not regret it. I promise. That's where I get most of my notes almost every time I do one of these podcasts. And every single time I make a list of hymns and I'm like, I, there's not going to be that much about some of these hymns, right? Mm. And then I start reading the stories and I end up with like literally 15 pages of mm. notes. It's every time. There's, every time. There's so many interesting stories about how these hymns come to be and the people that write them and their history in the church. And it's just, it's so fun to research. So there's my plug. And now, the Holy Week section in our hymnal is not new to Lutheran Service Book. It does exist in TLH. They're labeled specifically Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. In LSB, oh. they're not labeled that way. It's just Holy Week. But using context clues, it's pretty obvious <laughs> which ones are for Palm Sunday and which ones are for Monday, Thursday. And they're and, sort of in order that and they, way, right? And they are in order. Yeah. So, yeah, they're all kind of lumped into the Holy Week section. As usual, I did a... Sorry, I'm grabbing the mouse for the wrong computer and this is not my laptop. Move that. Okay. As usual, I did a poll in our Facebook group, which turned out to be um, not maximum science this time because <laughs> I should have just kind of locked it down to only these options since I knew I was focusing on only these hymns and I didn't do that. So this is my fault. But lots of ladies added a lot of extra Lenten hymns probably because people sing them during Holy Week, Mm -hmm. which is very fair. But the ones that are in our Lutheran service book, I'll give you the results of the poll right now. I'm doing this in kind of a different order than I normally do. And I'll tell you why in just a second. So winning the poll, not surprising, with 518 votes, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. That's a good one. Lutheran Mm -hmm. service book. Everyone loves this one. We We always sing it. I remember singing this when I was a kid. I have to tell you a funny story. Okay. So this is Lutheran humor, but I still remember one year we got a a Christmas letter from this family that we are friends with, and they announced the engagement of one of their daughters. Oh, no! Saying, yes, and and she has been stricken, smitten, and afflicted, and (laughs) now they're getting married. And it was cute. So... 
that's that's him nerd level right there yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> number two in the poll actually very close and i did not expect this one with four, 514 votes so very close to the first one all glory laud and honor oh. lsb 442 oh, that's, yeah. that's a palm sunday him uh-huh. yes mm-hmm. that was unexpected third place not unexpected Oh, Sacred Head Now Wounded with 449 votes. Mm -hmm. That's a very popular one. In fourth place, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Lutheran Service Book 456. That's an interesting one way up there as well. And then we've got uh, in fifth place, Right On, Right On in Majesty. Number six was Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Those are both Palm Sunday hymns. And then Sing My Tongue, The Glorious Battle, which is Mm. one of my favorites in seventh place. In eighth place, No Tramp of Soldiers, Marching Feet. Ah, I love this one. It's a new favorite for me. That is also Palm Sunday. And then When You Woke That Thursday Morning in ninth place, also one of my favorite ones. Um, my husband actually wrote an arrangement of this one with oboe and solo and choir. And let me tell you, the, the descant for that hymn mm. is always stuck in my head. It's mm. it's one of the best things he's written. It's amazing. That's anyway, how you know he loves you when he writes you a good descant. Man, mm-hmm. there are knows. not enough good dance dance in this world. The way to your heart, dance yeah. are the way to my heart. It's your, lo- it's your love language. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. true. Coffee and dance dance. <laughs> Call Gary Chapman. We found the seventh love language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we have "Upon the Cross Extended" in tenth place, and then "Oh Darkest Woe" in eleventh place. Another one of my favorites. Hmm. 12th place, Jesus in Your Dying Woes. I remember singing that one at Traore service when I was like a little tiny kid. Mm. Oh, Perfect Life of Love in 13th place. And then rounding it out, the Royal Banners Forward Go, which is another great one in 14th place. And then Jesus Greatest at the Table in last place place i think probably because we just don't sing that one a lot i'm not sure that i've sung that one a well because it's a monday oh. thursday hymn and on monday thursday we sing communion hymns only yes yes <laughs> tell us how you really feel i am very excited to know what your favorites are out of this list but i'm going to ask that at the end once we get through all of them i normally ask you right now but i'm going to talk about them first and then do it. And then I want to know what your opinions are. Do it. Although I can see visually that uh, there are some very strong opinions <laughs> in this room. Yeah. So can't wait to find out. Uh, yeah. So I mentioned that, that a lot of people added hymns that are Lent related that you may sing during Holy Week, but aren't actually listed as Holy Week hymns in the hymnal. We do this too. For example, we as in the people at my church. Sorry. Savior when in dust to thee is Lutheran service book 419. And we use it for Ash Wednesday. Rather than Holy Week, the death of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is now a communion hymn rather than a Holy Week hymn. So these have kind of gotten shifted around between our different hymnals. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I will ponder now, which is one of my favorites for the chief service on Good Friday. Oh, dearest Jesus, what law hast thou broken? Both of those are pretty commonly used on Good Friday, but they're in the general Lent section instead of the Holy Week section. So Hmm. this is not prescriptive. You don't have to use Mm -hmm. only Holy Week hymns for Holy Week and you're like banned from using the rest of them. Mm -hmm. They get kind of flipped around, you know, throughout the the church year and throughout between like Lent and Holy Week. It's it's fine. We just want to we don't want to cast such a wide net. You guys we are trying to narrow it. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the ones that that were included in the poll that I did not include because I am I am being very focused in this episode. Mm-hmm. But these were like my song is love unknown. When I survey the wonders cross, go to dark Gethsemane, mm. which sounds very much like a holy week hymn. Yeah, yeah that should be a holy week hymn. Very a holy week hymn. The lamb, which shows up frequently on him uh, <laughs> on him <laughs> polls. Christ, the life of all the living. Alas, and did my savior bleed. Lamb of God, pure and holy, which we definitely sing during the chief service on Good Friday. So that one qualifies. Yeah. In the cross of Christ, I glory. Come to Calvary's holy mountain. What wondrous love is this? We sing the praise of him who died and in the hour of trial. So, well, of course, we sing hymns kind of all over the place. And that's fine. Specifically at my song is love and known. That one is very closely associated with those churches that observe Passion Sunday. Aha. Uh-huh. Rather than Palm Sunday. Yep. Or if you if you do okay. both, I know some some churches have, you know, multiple services on that day. But yes, my song on love uh, is love unknown is a very passion Sunday hymn. Hmm. Uh, and you know what? I don't have a hymn of the day sheet in front of me. If I were at my desk, I'd have it. But I am curious now what the <laughs> hymn of the day 
that's prescribed for Passion Sunday. You should know that. Is time. and I should know that off the top. I'm of my trying head, to Google it. Actually, I've been trying to Google it while we talk here because I'm curious. But. I think if you Google like LCMS hymn of the day, there's an actual PDF and that's what I have at my desk. Uh-huh. So it's probably only, yeah. Okay. So there's, there's no exact science to this. I'm sure the hymnal committee had a reason why they put certain things in certain places. Obviously like Palm Sunday hymns mm. belong in Palm Sunday. Like, that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of obvious, but the rest of them, they can move around and that's cool. So for the sake of moving through these hymns, I did already cover the ones that everybody loves. Uh, <laughs> O oh, sacred head now wounded, stricken, smitten, and afflicted, and upon the cross extended. Those are all in the previous Lenten hymn podcast. So I know people love those. We can share the link in the show notes to the previous Lenten hymn podcast, and you can listen to those. I go in, into quite a lot of depth with those. They're Gerhardt. One of at least one of them is a okay, Gerhardt. We have They're an wonderful. answer. Ah, yes, we have an answer. My song is "Love Unknown" is the hymn of the day for the fifth Sunday in Lent. Which for you ah, one-year okay. lectionary people is Judica Sunday. Yes. A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth is the alternate ah. hymn of the day for Palm Sunday slash Sunday of the Passion. So that makes sense. There we go. Okay. I There's our answer. Happy to be wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Still a good hymn, though. Still a good hymn. Oh, and that Lamb hymn saying, I did actually have it in my notes. It's from March 2020. Mm. So pandemic time, everything gets kind of muddled Ooh. together. But that was from March 2020. March 20 purple. Yes. We'll share a link to that in the show. Notes. Um, so no, normally I go through these in poll order. So I like build it up to the last one. But because there's an actual progression during Holy Week for good order, I'm actually going to just go through these in the order that they are in the hymnal nice. and uh, give you some some snippets of things. So we're going to start on Palm Sunday. Mm. Right on, right on in Majesty Lutheran Service Book 441. And you can like follow along in your hymnal because I'm doing it this way this time. I'm doing that I like right this. now. You can be totally, like yeah. totally this nerdy about it. It's a great time. format. All right. I like it. So the story behind this, this is one of the ones I was like, there can't be a, that interesting of a story about this, right? Actually, no. It's mm. very interesting. So It's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so the short version, because there's a long version, a Reginald, Reginald, I don't actually know how to say his name. Heber, I'm going to say, because he was Anglican, not French. Could be. I'm just going to go just with own Hebert. It. Heber. Heber. Who Heber. lived, hmm. probably Heber. Reginald Heber. He lived 1783 to 1826. He was an Anglican priest in the early 1800s, holding some prestigious posts, including the university preacher at Oxford University in 1816 and preacher of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn in 1822. And that was an esteemed professional organization of judges and lawyers. So he like rubbed shoulders with some some pretty high ranking people. In 1823, he was consecrated as Bishop of India because this is when India was still British. Mm. So he spent a lot of time in India preaching and confirming both Indians and the English. He died of a stroke or a seizure at age 42 in India. He was very, very young. But during this time... In service to the church, he became very interested in quality and theologically correct hymnody. So he was a hymn nerd. His work (laughs) in hymnody laid foundations for hymnals to come in the late 1800s. He was writing hymns during a time when the Anglican church, if you know Anglican church history, that it was illegal to sing anything other than the old and new version of the Psalter. So he was a bit of a renegade in this. But a lot of priests, likely nonconformists, people who were not subscribing to the official governance of the Anglican Church, were creating their own hymnals. And Heber was concerned about the quality of these hymns. Uh, He said, I love this quote, he said he wanted to replace the, quote, vile trash, vile in sentiment and theology, as well as style, which prevails more or less in all of the collections. (laughs) Ouch. Strong opinions Oof, uh-huh. here right guts. Uh, to offer people, quote, something more obviously appropriate to the Christian feelings than the Psalms of David alone. So hmm. he set mm-hmm. out to create his own hymnal. OK, he based his hymnal on the seasons of the church year. I like that order, which was a new concept at this time, actually, that no one was really doing. And we've talked a little bit before about how older hymnals had things organized more by concepts or all the psalm paraphrases were like at the beginning of the hymnal. So like Mighty Fortress was actually in the psalm paraphrases instead of in like Reformation hymns or whatever, mm-hmm. wherever we, we have them organized today. So Heber wrote some hymns, he asked others to write some, and he reused some existing ones. Um, he wanted these to be practical hymns that working class people would sing every Sunday. 
So one of the people he approached to write new hymns was Henry Millman, who lived 1791 to 1868. So on December 5th, 1820, Heber asked if Millman would write some hymns on the subject of the gospel appointed for each day. Millman was vicar of St. Mary's in Reading, England. Although when I Googled this, there is also a St. Mary's in Reading, Pennsylvania. So not to get those mixed up. Different time, (laughs) different place. Different continent. Uh, He was also a popular dramatist for the London stage and in the process of election to the professorship of poetry at Oxford. So he composed the hymn in early 1821, and Heber was a huge fan of Millman's work on this hymn and the rest that he composed. Heber said, he said things like, quote, Alas, your Advent, Good Friday, and Psalm, Palm Sunday hymns have spoilt me for all other attempts of this sort. And, quote, I have not seen any lines of the kind which were completely correspond to my ideas of what such compositions ought to be or to the plan, the outline of which it has been my wish to fill up. So mm-hmm. he was quite a fan of Millman. Yeah. Heber wrote to the Bishop of London in 1821 to see if he thought the Archbishop of Canterbury would officially approve his publication of a new hymnal because this was not in the style that they were supposed to be singing. And the bishop was like, well, probably not, but your hymns are really good, so you should just publish them anyway without official sanction. Nice. (laughs) So Heber wanted to do just that, but he did die before his hymnals could be published. Hmm. But his widow finally published his hymnal, Hymns Written and Adapted to the Weekly Church Service of the Year, a long title in... uh, Yes, as one does, as one does Mm -hmm. in this time in 1827 and dedicated it with permission to the Archbishop of Canterbury. (laughs) Petty! (laughs) That's as close to an endorsement as he was going to get. (laughs) (laughs) We have four of Heber's hymns in the LSB, which I did not know. And these are great hymns. LSB 400, Brightest and Best of the Stars of the Morning. That's a fantastic Mm -hmm. epiphany hymn. Uh, 507, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, I had no idea that was him, uh right? 661, The Son of God Goes Forth to War. And 877, God Who Made the Earth and Heaven. So some really quality hymns. Nice. This particular hymn is for Palm Sunday, and it provides a lyric ode to communicate this grand vision of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. It's a hymn of faith that we confess that this triumphal entry is the road to the cross, our salvation in Christ. Hmm. So what I thought was not going to be an interesting story. (laughs) Turns out. (laughs) was a very interesting story. (laughs) All right. Next one. We're still in Palm Sunday, 442, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. This hymn is old. It's the Palm Sunday processional hymn that's been sung in a variety of forms since the ninth century. Pretty cool. Mm. I love it when our church music is this old. Mm -hmm. Like, think about all of the Christians that have come before us who have also sung this hymn. Like, how cool is that? That's crazy. Yes. So this is attributed to Theodulf, who lived around 760 to 821. I had a hard time not typing 1821. It's 821. It's 821. 821. It's a cool name, too. Right? Theodulf. Theodulf. I kept thinking of like Beowulf. Mm-hmm. And the- also Lord of the Rings, because it seems also like Lord a name that Rings. would be in Lord of the Rings. Fancy opportunity. It's yes. Oh, yes, yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> so he was Bishop of Orléans in France from around 798 to 817. He was born of Visigothic descent. We're going way back in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Likely in northern Spain. He was very well educated, and he was called to the court of Charlemagne at Aachen. Okay. Yeah, right? After spending time at a monastery. This was a big deal. Charlemagne was a big deal. Charlemagne appointed him to the Abbacy of Fleury, and the Bishop of Orléans somewhere between 794 and 798. And Charlemagne also encouraged him to create schools. And Theodulf was very successful doing this, establishing schools throughout Orléans, even some tuition-free ones in poorer areas. That's really cool. He was appointed as royal ambassador to the south of France in 798, 
But he saw that uh, there was a lot of like rampant bribery and corruption going on that needed some serious reforms in the what? court system. And so what else would he do but write a poem about it? Seems <laughs> so, logical. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I he was do. a poet. That's what he did. He also wrote prose about theological topics, including baptism, the creed, the mass. He even got himself caught up in the filioque debate in the Nicene Creed. Uh, so this guy was very much into theological topics. Common trap to fall into. <laughs> Right. Hmm. Uh, after Charlemagne died, he stayed in the good graces of the new Holy Roman Emperor, because this is the time of the Holy Roman Empire, Louis the Pious. But he was removed from his post in 1818. Sorry, 818. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss me every time. When he was banished to a monastery in Angers for his suspected help in a plot to overthrow King Louis. Woof. He, yeah, he Another one that I was like, what what kind of interesting story is this going to have? But nope, plot to overthrow the king. Uh, <laughs> More like Louis the paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> so Theodolf consistently maintained his innocence. He may have been released before he died in 821, or he might have been poisoned. We don't know. Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> one of the two. So the, the actual story of the hymn is that unlike other medieval hymns where attribution sometimes is a bit wishy-washy because they're so old, mm. scholars are pretty rock solid that this one is Theodulf's. He likely wrote it between 817 and 820 when Theodulf was banished. So the mm. legend is that Theodulf sang this hymn from his cell as the king passed in procession. And the king was so moved by it that he ordered Theodulf's release. But not a lot of historical evidence to back this up. Like the king may not have even been there when Theodolf was in prison. So we don't really know. It's a cool story, though. So a little uh, extra nerdy tidbit for this one. Medieval hymns are usually patterned as ours are in English by stressed and unstressed syllables. But Theodolf used the classical form of meter determined by long and short vowels. So even in his day in the 800s, uh, this hymn would have sounded lofty and old fashioned. So there's that. Uh, John mm -hmm. Mason Neal who we've covered before, yep. a big name, translated this hymn and it appeared in Hymns Ancient and Modern in 1861. John which, Mason Neal, why am I not surprised to find him hanging out here? Uh, he comes up several times, too. He has a lot of hand in a lot of these hymns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Next. 443, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Jeanette Threlfall. Has she shown up before? No. I feel like we've talked about her. Okay. I don't think we've heard that name I might yet. have to do one just on her. But anyway, uh, she lived 18, 1821 to 1880. We've moved forward a, a several thousand years. thousand years, <laughs> literally. <laughs> she wrote this hymn for children, and it was published in her Sunshine and Shadow book in 1873. And she herself knew a lot of pain as a child. She was orphaned at a young age, and she had two really terrible accidents that left her crippled for most of her life. So she had mm. a really hard life. Mm. But this, the hymn is so joyful. It shares the joy of the children as they praise Jesus during his entry to Jerusalem. So this is one of the like really upbeat, happy ones. Mm. And so, of course, today it shares the joy of the children as they whap each other with palm fronds. Yes. Yeah, right in the eye. Paper cuts on the eye. Yep. yep. 444, no tramp of soldiers marching feet. I love this one. This one doesn't mm. have a really crazy story, which I was hoping it would, but it doesn't, which can is I, okay. Can I offer something? Yes. And you can decide to cut it later. But in the LSB on page, it wouldn't be 445, but it's the 444 and a half. Four, it's 444 and a half. At the bottom is printed the collect for the Sunday of the Passion. Ooh. And I misread a part of it. <laughs> so I would like to pray that now. With my misreading, oh, no. because it's it's not bad. Trust me, I would not. It's okay. not sacrilegious. Okay? okay, you can cut it later if you want. So let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made pancakes of his resurrection. <laughs> Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. What's the original? What is the actual word? Partakers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a pancake of the resurrection. All right. <laughs> next. 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 As long as there's oh, a resurrection, I don't care if I'm a pancake or whatever. Mm. A waffle. A waffle. A waffle. French toast. French, French toast. I just want to be there with him. Sorry. That took a turn. Okay, but this one, <laughs> I don't mind at all. 
So No Trampa Soldiers Marching Feet is actually my favorite Palm Sunday hymn. Mm. I I don't think it was in hymnals until... Yeah, so it was not in hymnals until maybe Hymnal Supplement 98. I didn't look it up, but it is definitely a newer hymnal. Mm -hmm. Hymnal. Newer hymn. Mm. It was written by Timothy Dudley Smith in August 17... 17, Oh my goodness. Numbers are hard for my brain today. (laughs) 1979. Yikes. At Seacroft, his vacation home in Ruin Minor, Cornwall, England. What I love most about this hymn, and hopefully you guys get to sing this on Palm Sunday, is the juxtaposition of the royal nature of Christ's entry with the humble character of his reign. And the tune really solidifies solidifies this too, because it makes you think of soldiers marching. But then if you read the words to what you're actually singing, there were no soldiers marching and no bells, no sound, no tramping, no city gates swinging wide. Mm -hmm. So there's this, the tune makes you kind of feel like it's marching, but there was no marching. Hmm. So I don't know. I really love this one. And also uh, Lutheran Church Canada had, they they, they post hymns uh, somewhat regularly on their Facebook page. And one of their posts was this hymn, but done like with solo voice and guitar. And it was just haunting. I loved hmm. it. Loved it. We have not talked about Timothy Dudley Smith yet. So I'm going to throw in a bit of his story right here. He's another person that that y'all should know about. He's a brilliant hymn writer. He was born on December 26, 1926 in Manchester, England. Grew up in Buxton, Derbyshire. He's also another one of the hymn writers that is still with us today. Nice. Yeah. He has a bachelor and master degree from Pembroke College. Also attended Ridley Hall, Cambridge. He was ordained in the Church of England as a deacon in 1950 and a priest in 1951. And he's been involved in a variety of places and vocations throughout his life including most recently Archdeacon of Norwich from 1973 to 1981 and consecrated Bishop of Thetford from 1981 to 1991. And he retired in 1992, but he continues to write hymns and his hymns have had a a major influence on 20th century hymnody. So he's one of the leading figures of the 20th century hymn explosion with more than 500 hymn texts in hymnals throughout the English-speaking world. Like, this dude has written a ton of stuff. Hmm. He's been awarded several titles and recognition, including in 2003, Queen Elizabeth II made him an officer of the Order of the British Empire for his services to hymnody. So, nice. he is a big deal. Oh, I'm going to miss Queen Elizabeth II so much whenever the Lord takes her home because... I just can't imagine any other member of the royal family awarding an OBE for services to hymnody. Right. I know. Oh, what a gem. Yes. He was married to June Arlette McDonald for almost 50 years before she passed away in 2007, and they have three children. So there is Timothy Dudley Smith. Great dude. Lots of hymns. Lots of really good hymns. All right. We are moving on. We're speeding through Holy Week. <laughs> yeah. Not very fast. We're still on Palm Sunday. Well, we're yeah. now we're in oh, now we're Monday, Thursday. We're sauntering. Okay. We have skipped several okay. days. But we're there. Yes. So, so the time between Palm Sunday <laughs> and Monday, Thursday, if you have service, some churches have services every day of Holy Week. Those are probably the days that you would sing all the other Lenten hymns mm-hmm. that, you know, we don't quite get to mm-hmm. or whatever. So we are now in Holy Thursday. Okay. My favorite Holy Thursday one. When you woke that Thursday morning. This hymn came about in 1991, so this is another newer one, Mm -hmm. when the Commission on Worship for the LCMS asked Yaroslav Vida to write a new hymn to mark the 25th anniversary of the ordination of the Commission's Executive Director, Dr. Mm -hmm. James Brower. Vida had an, a quote, near obsession phase of his work with the centrality of word and sacrament in worship, which you can see in a lot of his hymns. And this hymn is all about the sacramental experience of the Last Supper in the Upper Room. And it's a beautiful hymn for Holy Thursday. And I don't know if I've said this on the podcast or if this is just something that my husband and I talk about because we talk about hymnody. But you've got you've got Vida and you've got Starkey and Starkey's are like these rich, vivid imageries that are like just very real and Vida's has a lot more emotion attached to a lot mm. of his hymnody, which if you read through some of his texts, you can kind of you can kind of see that. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's and, a Luther and Sarah thing. I don't think we've talked about that on the <laughs> podcast. That's just no. you guys on your date nights sure. talking hips. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, and Vida and Carl Schalk have so many collaborations. Hmm. It's fantastic. Anyway, I also went to Concordia Chicago, which is like super Vida Schalk 
territory. Mm-hmm. But um, I thought for sure we had talked about Yaroslav Vida before, but I couldn't find him in my we have previous not. notes. We have okay, not. So, so this is the other uh, hymn writer story you get, you get today because he's also someone we should know about. And I totally thought he was foreign born. He's not. He was born in Ohio. He was born on... <laughs> April 28th, 1919 in Lorraine, Ohio. Very Midwestern Lutheran. Yes. <laughs> but he was the son of a Slovak Lutheran pastor. Mm-hmm. And he was named after the Slavic saint whose day was April 27th. So that's where he gets the, the his name from. He grew up in Indiana Harbor, which is basically East Chicago, Indiana, where his dad was serving as pastor. So he went on to Concordia Junior College in Fort Wayne from 1933 to 1938, which was before it was seminary. And then he worked for a year in the Indiana Harbor Steel Mills to earn money for tuition. And then he went to Concordia Seminary St. Louis, where he earned his B.A. in 1941 and B.Div., which I didn't realize was a thing, Whoa! in 1944. So he was in the seminary during World War II. That must have been very interesting, interesting. especially with Slavic heritage. But anyway, his divinity degree thesis was... Oh, I forgot. There's a lot of uh, pronunciation in this story that I will definitely butcher. Power through. You I can do, do not it, girl. know how to pronounce any of these you words. You can do it. A history of the Stara Sanctorum, which is the Slavic Lutheran hymnal of George Tronovsky. Uh, Slovak, uh, Yuri Trunov- not Slavic. You're right. Slovak. Slovak. And as I'm Sorry. learning uh, throughout my uh, intensive study of the Slavic countries recently, there is a difference. <laughs> Sorry, I misspoke. Slovak, not Slavic. Slovak. Slovak. It's because of his name, Yaroslav. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, you're, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. you're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So because of his Slovak heritage. Mm-hmm. Yes. So Yuri Tronovsky was a Slovak Reformation era hymn writer. And his hymnal, I am not even going to try to pronounce it because I will butcher it. No one will know what I'm saying. In English, it's Harps of the Saints, Spiritual Songs, Ancient and Modern. Uh, This was a mainstay of the Slovak Lutheran Church well into the 20th century. So Tarnowski was a a huge part of uh, Lutheran heritage for the Slovak Lutheran Church. So after Vida graduated, he served as pastor of three bilingual churches, uh, Slovak and English, in Pennsylvania and Indiana. He was appointed editor of This Day magazine in 1963, which some of our listeners may recognize. I don't, but some may, which was a (laughs) monthly family publication from CPH. After that publication was discontinued in 1971, he became editor and book developer for CPH, guiding around 200 books from conception to publication until he retired in 1986. I had no idea he worked that long for CPH. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. He had been interested in poetry at a really young age. So when he was 21, he started translating the 32 sonnet anti-war epic of Slovakia's leading poet, Pavel Orsag. Oh, boy. Vizdoslav. H-V-I-E. Z-D-O-S-L-A-V. It was published in America as Bloody Sonnets in 1950. It earned international acclaim. Hmm. Uh, His interest in poetry, hymnody, writing, music, and liturgy catapulted him into his work with the LCMS Commission on Worship from 1960 to 1978, which produced Worship Supplement 69, The Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch. Yes! My favorite little red book of hymns that I didn't know existed until we started doing this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Also within which lies many of my favorite hymns that I never knew were in that book. Um, And also the Inter-Lutheran Commission on Worship from 1967 to 1978, which prepared Lutheran Book of Worship. Hmm. So he didn't actually get serious about writing hymns until he was nearly 50 years old. So ladies, it's never too late to do like anything. Mm. And his first hymn of prominence was Now the Silence, which I'm hoping all of you have sung. Mm. It's very contemplative, lots of imagery. I don't know if there's any punctuation in it. That might be the, the fun thing about it. it w- it's in our hymnals as a Vida Schalk collaboration, which happens frequently. He went on to write more than 200 original hymns and carol texts and translations that are in more than 50 hymnals and collections in Christian denominations on six continents. So his hymns are everywhere. Mm. He has books available from CPH on hymnody with his original hymnody. And he has several honorary degrees from a lot of places. I didn't even list (laughs) them. And in 1988, the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada which Amanda Husberg was also a part of, bestowed on him their highest award. That's a big deal. Hmm. So his texts are full of this imagery and feeling. They're often unusual poetic forms, which makes them really fun. 
And they're always very beautiful, um, evocative poetry. And it's always very rooted in Lutheran theology of praise, thanksgiving, and proclamation. Vida died on May 10th, 2008, here in St. Louis, where he and his wife, Margaret, had lived for 45 years. Mm. So he was he was a St. Louisan. So we have 10 of his hymns and translations in our Lutheran service book. Some of these you more than likely will recognize. 369, Where Shepherds Lately Knelt. I love that one. 445, When You Woke That Thursday Morning. I didn't put a number on this one. Up Through the Endless, up through endless Ranks of Angels. I think that's a Garricky I was just, tune. It is. Mm. And I think... He's a, I think he must have been a big fan of yes, him because I know he that was. he had to sing several of, of his. Yes. Okay. Yep. Garricky okay. is a Vita fan. That's Henry Garricky. Mm-hmm. He was the choir director here at the IC, so we know him. Yes. We know him well, and he's so sweet. 593, See This Wonder in the Making. That's a baptism hymn. 910, Now the Silence. 922, Go My Children with My Blessing. That's a Vita. Mm-hmm. Very popular. Uh-huh. Very yeah. popular. And then his translations, 371, Let Our Gladness Banish Sadness. That's a really fun Christmas hymn. Very easy. Like, hmm. kids should totally sing that one. 484, Make Songs of Joy to Christ Our Head. I don't know if I've sung that one. 896, Now Greet the Swiftly Changing Year, which might be hymn of the day for New Year's hmm. Day or Eve, I mm-hmm. think. Because we don't have very many New Year's Eve sense. slash day hymns yeah. in our hymnal. That might be the only one. <laughs> and then 945, Your Heart, O God, is Grieved, We Know. So... Lots of good Vita hymns in our hymnal. Okay, moving on. 446, Jesus Greatest at the Table. The only thing I really have to say about this one is that it's written by Stephen Starkey, and I'm sad we don't sing it more. (laughs) (laughs) The text is great. I've really never sung it. So there you go. We should all sing that one more. Good Friday and Holy Saturday all get kind of mixed together. Mm, Unless you have an Easter vigil, you probably don't have service on Holy Saturday. That's not really a thing. One of these years for Lent, I want to do an episode on the Triduum and go through like the whole Holy Thursday through Easter Vigil thing, but that's not for today. So good (laughs) Good Friday and Holy... This is like my favorite time of year. Good Friday and Holy Saturday are all mixed together in the hymnal. So 447, Jesus in your dying woes. This hymn is probably pretty familiar. It's in LSB, was in TLH. I remember singing this one every Traore service on Good Friday in between the readings. It's the Septum Verba, which is the seven words from the cross. Mm. So a lot of times for a Traore service, well, I shouldn't say a lot of times. In my experience in Traore services, it's split into the seven words from the mm-hmm. cross. And so it'll be like a, an introduction, a prayer, a part of a stanza of a hymn, a little meditation, and then we'll sing the appropriate hymn from the, the Jesus in Our Dying Woes. That's what I remember from childhood. So I know this one really well. This one was written by Thomas B. Pollock, who lived 1836 to 1896. He also died young. He and his brother had experienced a lot of their own liturgy, litany, and poverty in their work at St. Albans Mission in Birmingham, England from 1865 to 1896. It was in a poverty-ridden neighborhood. And remember, this is the industrial age of sweatshops and mills. So it was a really hard life for the people in that area. And high church practices brought some order to their life. And so this hymn was part of that. He wrote it in 1870. And it's seven groups of three stanzas following the seven words from the cross. And the last line of each is, Hear us, Holy Jesus. And that's a really good litany for anyone to keep on their hearts, Mm. especially during hard times. So Mm. there's that one. Next one is 448, Oh Darkest Woe. I love this one. This is actually the hymn of the day for Holy Saturday. A lot of times we'll sing it at Good Friday services, at chief service, maybe on Good Friday. If you do a chief service instead of a triore, some churches do one or the other. And chief service does not equal tenebrae because tenebrae is in the evening. But anyway, I, I love this one. It feels very dark and somber, which I it's it's a heavy one for Good Friday. And I like that. I love the text of it. When we meditate on Christ who lays dead in the tomb, it's it's a very heavy one. Thanks be to God. We know the end of the story, though, mm. because boy, Amen. that would be that would be rough if we didn't. Mm-hmm. So this one is partially by Jesuit Friedrichs Spee von Lagenfeld who lived 1591 to 1635. He wrote the first stanza, which appeared in three Catholic hymn books in 1628. 
in one of these books, they referred to the custom of creating and venerating a tomb on the side chapel after the Good Friday liturgy, which would then hold the ciborium or monstrance that contained the reserved body of Christ. And then that would be returned to the altar at Easter Vigil. And I think we talked about this at the Easter Vigil episode. That's ringing bells in my head that, mm. that we talked about that custom. Spee had six more stanzas that were not fit for our Lutheran doctrine for a variety of reasons. It happens. Which is why we only have his first one (laughs) here. But that first stanza got to Lutheran dramatist and poet Johann Rist, who has shown up in other podcasts. He's He's also a fantastic hymn writer. He loved the text and the striking tune. This tune is very unique. So much that he wrote an additional seven stanzas, of which we have six in our Lutheran service book. So his text focuses on Christ and his salvific work for us. I love this text because it's very explicit about our theology that God himself died for humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. In the line, I think it stands at two, oh, sorrow, dread, our God is dead upon the cross extended. And if that like doesn't get you right in the neck on right Good Friday or Holy Saturday, man... I don't know what will. That translation of the original God himself lies dead was God's son is dead in TLH and God's son is slain in LW to avoid the Patripassianism heresy. (laughs) They were trying to avoid it. Whatever else Um, you say, that is just the the ultimate soundbite from this episode, Sarah. (laughs) We don't really deal with that heresy a lot in our Lutheran circles, not typically Mm. anyway. So... Lutheran service book chose the very strong Our God is Dead Hmm. because we know what that means. We're very explicit in all of this in our Lutheran doctrine and theology. So I rather like it. Nope. No sugarcoating. So I really like that one. Even if you don't sing it this Holy Week, I would highly suggest that you read through it devotionally. It's a great one. Hmm. So the next two. O Sacred Head Now Wounded, I guess it's actually three because O Sacred Head Now Wounded has two tunes. And 451, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. Everyone's obvious favorites, but we've already covered them, so I'm going to move past them. So good. Moving right along. 452, we are making progress. Yeah, we are. I only have like one and a half more pages of notes. Yes! (laughs) For like two more (laughs) hymns. See y'all in half an hour. Right? 452. Hopefully not a half hour. Oh, <laughs> oh, perfect life of love. This hymn was written by Sir Henry Williams Baker. Such a good British name. Who mm. lived 1821 to 1827. It first appeared in the 1875 edition of Hymns Ancient and Modern. <laughs> so many hymns in that hymnal that we still have today. I remember singing this one a whole lot too growing up with TLH. So it's another Great tried and true Good Friday hymn. When is that book from? 1875. So it really should be hymns that are ancient and even more ancient. (laughs) I mean, but he wrote it. Dusty. Ancient and dusty. (laughs) Ancient and dusty. (laughs) Dusty and crusty. <laughs> That'll get everyone to sing them. I will sing it. Sing this dusty hymn. Okay. We are we are rounding the bend. We are rounding the bend. So the next two are written by Venantius Honorius Clemen, Clementianus Fortunatus, which is the best name ever. All right. And John Mason Neal collaboration. Yeah. So we've got Sing My Tongue, The Glorious Battle, and The Royal Banners for Where We Go. But these are both written by... Fortunatus. So I'm going to tell you his story first because that actually tells you the story of how these hymns came to be. So Fortunatus was born around 540. So this also are very, 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 very old hymns in northern Italy. His formal and classical education happened in Ravenna. He went on a pilgrimage to Tours in Gaul, which is modern France. And in 567, he came to the court of Miro- oh, Merovingian King Sigibert. Ooh. Also a great name. Sounds legit. We need fan fiction for these people. <laughs> so Merovingian fan fiction. Let's get out of it. We've got Ver- Merovingians and Visigoths today. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a great, great history lesson. Oh my gosh, we're doing it. <laughs> So he went with the king on his travels, writing and reciting poetry as they went. This was a thing to like accompany royalty and just read poetry to them. This was this was a thing in those times because he and Theodolf actually lived not too far apart from each other and not too far apart uh, geographically either. 
all French stuff. Okay. So he settled he settled in Poitiers in eastern France. I have been there. Nice. But anyway, in France is my favorite. In the early 570s <laughs> and became a close friend of Radegund. Maybe you've heard of Radegund. No. I've heard the name. I didn't know who she was. She was a Thuringian princess, another geographical area to cover today, but was captured by the Franks and forced to marry a Merovingian king, Clothar I. So Queen Radegund established the St. Croix Monastery at Poitiers and then wanted to present a large relic of a cross of Christ given by the Eastern Roman Emperor to her nunnery. So Fortunatus wrote several hymns to be sung during the procession of the relic from Tours to Poitiers, which is about 64 miles. That's a long way to travel Mm -hmm. in 540. Well, it wouldn't have been 540. 570s. These hymns included Pange Lingua Glorio Ciprelium Certaminis, Certaminis, yeah, which is Sing My Tongue the Glorious Battle, and Vexilla Regis Prodeunt, which is The Royal Banners Forward Go. It was apparently a glorious and very reverent procession with priests and censers of incense and singing and all of this pomp and circumstance for this procession of the relic, which was supposed to be part of the actual cross of Christ. After Radegund died in 587, Fortunatus became a priest and then bishop of Poitiers in 599. He died sometime in the early 600s. We don't know exactly when. Um, He also wrote several biographies of saints, including Hilary of Poitiers, Martin of Tours, Germain of Paris, Paris, and Radegund, in addition to volumes of poetry in Latin. So this guy just, he wrote a lot. It's a lot of writing. So specifically, Sing My Tongue, The Glorious Battle had 10 stanzas originally, with a doxological stanza concluding the whole thing. It was translated into English over 25 times. Wow. Including John Mason Neal's translation Hmm. from 1851. This translation was heavily altered in the 1875 Hymns Ancient and Modern, again, And by Percy Dermer in Songs of Praise from 1931. And we have a slightly altered version of Dermer's translation in our Lutheran service book. So in medieval times, this hymn was used from Passion Sunday to the Wednesday of Holy Week. So this would have been one of those intermediate hymns as the office hymn for matins, which at that time was traditionally around two or three in the morning and lauds traditionally around 5 a.m., dividing the stanzas in between the offices. So we in Lutheran service book follow the Roman rite by using this hymn for adoration of the cross in the chief service liturgy for Good Friday, which is where if you have chief service, that's where you're probably singing it. It's also used for the Feast of the Holy Cross on September 14th and the Roman Feast of Corpus Christi, which we have talked about before, Mm -hmm. where they use Aquinas's Now My Tongue, the Mystery Telling, which was inspired by this hymn. We talked about this when we covered Aquinas in a previous podcast. It uses the same first phrase for the hymns. So these are like Mm. cousin hymns. And then specifically for the Royal Banners Forward Go, originally had eight stanzas with two more added around the 10th or 11th centuries. Our modern hymnals have a wide variety of stanzas and translations in use. It was translated into English around 37 times, including John Mason Neal's translation, Mm. uh, which might be the best one because it holds true to the meaning of the original text and cadence of the Latin into English. And that's actually, John Mason Neal shows up so much because he's, he was really good at that. That was like his jam. So our text is a variation of Neal's translation with one stanza that was likely not written by Fortunatus. Hmm. And rounding home, 456, were you there? The African-American spiritual. And now for queen. something completely different. Right. Yep. So. We have gone from Visigoths to Moravians and Thuringia to Britain. And now we've arrived at an African-American spiritual. So the this best. is an American mm. spiritual in our hymnal. So we do have a, a spiritual, I did a spirituals podcast. So a lot of the background on general spiritual history is in that podcast. So I'm not going to cover all of that. As lots of spirituals, the origin of this hymn is unknown, likely originated by enslaved people, passing it down from generation to generation through oral tradition. And there wasn't really any effort to write down spirituals until after the Civil War when they were introduced to American and European audiences during the tours of the Jubilee Singers of Fisk University beginning in the 1870s. And we know that these spirituals are very popular today. Lots of choirs sing them still. So the original version from 1892 had four questions. Were you there when they crucified my Lord, crowned him with the thorns, pierced him in the side, 
and laid him in the tomb. Various other questions have been added throughout the years. We have a bit of a mix in Lutheran service book. In the spirituals episode, we, we talked a lot about how spirituals generally have a double meaning, uh, redemption from sin and freedom from slavery. This applies to this hymn as well. The visual imagery of nailing Christ to the tree might have had a deeper meaning to enslaved people who observed lynchings mm -hmm. in their own communities after the Civil War. And they understand shame and anguish in a way that a lot of us can't because we haven't experienced those things. The cross had an obvious religious significance and also a deeper meaning of trials and suffering in a cruel world. Mm -hmm. And in the final stanza, it says, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Probably not a reference to fear, but the emotion of what Christ faced as he went to the cross relating to the physical and emotional challenges that enslaved people faced in their own lives. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the reality that the God who created the world would go through such intense suffering in order to reconcile himself to the world. So a lot of, a lot of double meaning right there. We have come to the end of Holy Week, which means Easter is right around the corner. We know what happens on Easter, so this isn't completely ending on a down note. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be, we can't study Easter hymns right now because it's still Lent. So, still Lent, guys. <laughs> still Lent, guys. So now I would like to know briefly, probably, because it's been it's only 52 minutes. We have not really? hit the hour. Yes. Yes. Good. Good. We have work, not team. hit an hour yet. So, wow. I would like to know what your favorites are and if your favorite has changed from the beginning of the episode mm. to the end now that oh. I've gone through them. Oh. Challenge. I mean, it, it didn't have to. I'm just curious if it did. Not that you know stories. I really love 456 so much. Like deep down in my body. It's beautiful. It just sounds beautiful. It is it's, beautiful. It's somber. I don't know. It's just got that classic Holy Week vibe. Yeah. Seriously. Mm -hmm. But also like it very, it very obviously references how the story does end, mm -hmm. which I think is, mm -hmm. is good. And I don't know because the original questions that you mentioned was not the one used in stanza four. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to see. That seems like a very Lutheran thing to do. Yep. It's to be like, oh, this is not where this laying him in the tomb, guys. It's not where the story ends. Right. Let's fix this. Right. I, I'm with you, Bree. This is, I mean, and it may be because it's such, the lyric is so simple that I've known and loved it since I was a very young child. But Were You There is just, has and always will be one of my favorite Holy Week hymns. I love the, this is, maybe not everybody does, but the the O's in the middle. You're yes. literally oh. wailing yep. at yeah. the thought. Of Jesus on the cross and the trembling is exactly the right emotion because that's what I feel when I hear the passion account you know I'm just like it it hits it hits it leaves me weak in the knees uh-huh mm -hmm. yes. I actually mm -hmm. I do like it better without the fourth stanza <laughs> yeah I think that the the earlier versions that focus and so our good Friday hymns they don't all end with and then he rose from the dead. Don't worry. No, they it's don't. coming. Yeah. They end with him in the tomb. And that's where the original, you know, original mm -hmm. verses of Were You There end. It's not that we don't want that hope of the resurrection. It's just that when you're singing this hymn on Good Friday, it's not time yet um, right. that we, we enjoy things in the fullness of time. So mm -hmm. I do I do like yeah. it. But when I've been involved in worship planning, sometimes we've left off the fourth verse if we sing it during Holy oh. Week. And you can do ah. that. You can do that. I yeah. also I feel like you can do that during Holy Week, but if you do it right, <laughs> I have noticed that, like, if it's used like as a communion hymn or something like that, and communion is wrapped up, and if they end it there and it's no. not, no, yeah, don't no. it's like Sing no, the whole hymn. no. Yeah, as <laughs> a Holy going. Week hymn, you can sit with that. That's what we do in Holy Week is we we sit in that time and. We don't rush ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. my old favorite. That's that's the the mm. comfort food, the macaroni and cheese of Holy Weekends mm. for me. Oh yes. <laughs> but my my adult favorite, <laughs> my gumbo favorite. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Would probably be Sing My Tongue the Glorious Battle. Um, yes. I really love that. It it highlights the fact that what we see on the cross. A weak man dying is not mm -hmm. the spiritual reality of what's going on in the passion. That the spiritual reality is the prince of all creation is mm -hmm. engaged in a 
deadly duel and he wins by die. You know, it, it, at the yeah. end of this, death and hell and the grave and all of the sin, everything has the Lord's sword run through its throat. Yes. And, so, and guts. Yeah, it's in yeah, guts. Yeah. Like there's guts everywhere. <laughs> And so I, I nice. think that Fortunatus's lyric is, and, and the, the very martial tune that we have it to, thanks, yes. Carl Schock. Yes! Sing my tongue the glorious Shock. battle, sing the ending of the fray. Now above the cross the trophy, sound the Lord triumphant lay. Tell how Christ, the world's redeemer, as a victim, won the day. And knowing this came out of the, you know, barbarian past, <laughs> 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 I think gives gives a certain... I don't know, authenticity to it, that this was written by a guy who had probably witnessed uh, mm. combat with swords and spears. Um, mm -hmm. And so would have had a very clear and concrete vision in mind when he talked about our Lord uh, entering into combat by his death on the cross. So that's yeah. that's my grown up favorite. We don't actually sing it that much. I think because there are so many wonderful Holy Week hymns mm -hmm. that are, I think, more familiar to people. Like, I love Stricken, Smitten, and Aff Afflicted. Mm -hmm. That one makes yes. me tremble, tremble, tremble. Yeah. <laughs> and Oh Sacred Head Now Wounded and all, oh, all the rest yeah. of them. So that oftentimes something that's a little bit less familiar, like Sing My Tongue, The Glorious Battle, gets left off. Not because people don't like it, but there's just no room in the liturgy yeah. for it. So I don't just. get to sing it as much as I would like. But whenever I do, <laughs> my goodness, full gusto singing for yes. Fortunatus and John Mason Neal. <laughs> Holy Week deep cut service. Ooh. Deep cuts. Well, that's, with that's what you do when you get all of the Holy Week services instead of just true. The, yeah. you know, the big the big two. If yeah. we were singing matins at 2 a.m. on Holy Tuesday, of course I, I we'd know, have space exactly. for Sing My Time right. Glorious Battle. Besides. Our <laughs> these. Besides. <laughs> I, yeah. There's a little snippet for the tune. I'm glad you mentioned that for Sing My Tongue that Shulk did. Ba, 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 makes a cross in musical notation. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's singing uh, about the cross, and the music literally makes a cross. Like, mm -hmm. Shulk was a genius. Mm -hmm. So. Nice. Yeah, for sure. No, you can thank Luther for that. <laughs> My husband. <laughs> Shulk did not know Martin Luther personally. Yeah, they were not. They were, no, centuries they apart. were not contemporary. They were not fact. contemporary. But, no, but no. Shulk got it from a. He he wasn't the first to come up with that. Bach used to do that sort of thing. Oh, Bach, man, Bach in theology. He that his name days. into several yeah. of his compositions. <laughs> yes, he did. When That's your name is made up of B's and C's. Four pages of notes. <laughs> You can do that. Yep. You That's an entire it. novel. That's a library of notes. No, it's a whole year of podcasts. Frankly. All right, Aaron. So ironically, mm. Rachel's adult hymn was actually my childhood um, <laughs> favorite. <Hey! laughs> um, I I actually have, and it was it was the melody, and to an extent the the words, but I'm sure uh, particularly the melody that just captured captured me. But I have vivid memories of sitting on our couch at home with the hymnal in my lap, oh. belting this one out. It yes. Is. I was belting just like, oh, <laughs> core. So, and so <laughs> core memory, it. core memory <laughs> yeah, of like elementary school <gasps> age. Oh, um, and it. so, yeah, that one has been a long time, long time favorite. But also you're right. It doesn't get a lot of, a lot of actual singing. So during today's podcast, yeah, I I really was I really was more struck by Oh Darkest Woe, yes. um, which is not one that I feel like I've maybe I've sung it once or twice, probably at work, but, yeah, you know, in chapel, which is gives me a lot more exposure to more hymns. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be looking at that one more closely this year during Holy Week in yes. particular. The words are very striking to me so they are yeah yes. yeah all right nice wrapping it up at an hour look at that look <laughs> at you with <laughs> this constant process improvement Whew, we covered you, 
We covered a lot of ground. Kudos I am to you. busy from all the all the hymns and hymn writers we covered today. Yeah. Me too, but I, I had think my spinning. blood sugar is just low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty late in the day for us. Have too. some more gumbo. So low, okay. More yeah, gumbo. Right, yeah. like, <laughs> we have food. <laughs> so I, I want to do this podcast before Holy Week so that all of you ladies would actually have time to like digest mm-hmm. it and look mm-hmm. through the hymns and then know stuff to yeah. look for during Holy Week instead of dropping it during Holy Week when stuff has already passed. So like that's that. why, even though it's not Holy Week yet, I wanted to do this early to mm-hmm. give you some prep time. <laughs> Prepare your hearts, people. Yes. It's real. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you can maybe go into Holy Week knowing a little bit more about some of the hymns that you might be singing during that week. So thanks for joining me on this journey through Holy oh, Week. This yay. has been this has been great. I had a lot of fun researching this. I'm going to sleep coast so emotions. well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find all of our previous hymn sing podcasts including the previous Lenten from 2020 that we will link in the show notes at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app or on the KFUO radio app. You can share your favorites for Holy Week hymnody. There's a poll still in the Facebook group, but you can just share your own thoughts anyway in our Facebook group, the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can also share your photos and stories with us on Instagram at Lutheran Ladies Lounge there as well. If you're not on social media or you like to get us in your inbox, you can join our monthly e-newsletter list. You can find out how to sign up for that in the show notes of this podcast, or you can send an email to lutheranladies at kfuo.org and we'll take care of you from there. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Aaron. I'm a pancake of his resurrection. (laughs) Now I can't cut it out. I know. (laughs) And I'm tremble, um, tremble, trembling. And they'll hear so I didn't really in think you were going to cut it. I, I'm really, I, re- it. I really am full of myself, aren't I? <laughs> I, mean, fairness, I rarely cut the things that we say we're going to cut. That's true. I just That's leave it and sometimes there. we air the things that we say we're never going to air. Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. Unless it's heretical, it's probably going in. <laughs> That should be our show slogan, our unofficial sl- show slogan. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going in. That'll get everyone to listen. Right on. KFUO Radio and the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast are underwritten in part by Ad Crusum. Visit them online at adcrucem.com. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Join our community on Facebook in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you Crucified, my Lord. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Cause 
causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you him from the tomb. Were you there when God raised him from the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble